Great. Thank you. Good morning. So we thought we would just sort of summarize what, what we thought were some of the key points, and if we got them wrong, you all could correct us, and, uh, and if we missed some things, you could also add those, so that would be great. Uh, so kind of walking through, these are, these are very word-heavy slides, my, my apologies. Um, some of what we heard from the laboratory sessions, uh, obviously sharing genomic data, very critical. Um, many labs are willing, but, uh, but the fact that this requires resources is often not um, uh, identified. So Dan, are you having trouble hearing me? or? They just turned it off. Sorry. It's, you know, it's, I, I think I'm close enough to the microphone, but who knows. Um, and then um, uh, this issue of, of not putting things into clinical care until they're well established is a real challenge when, as, as Heidi pointed out, some of these things, the vast majority, in fact, are, are found only in one family. So you, you really only see them a few times, and, and you can't get them to be well established. Um, delivering information from available sequence takes resources, so going back and querying it, updating it needs resources. Um, categories were changed, as we heard. 300 times, I, I think, uh, in, at one point, and about 4% of doctor reports change per year, which is uh, pretty astonishing. Um. We also heard a, a little bit of concern about how one, one can get CLIA certified labs to do sequencing, um, and, and that requires resources as well. Um, and we also uh, heard that much of the recent growth in genomic testing is in, in infectious diseases and, and also to some degree in cancer. Uh, any disputes here? I'll, you all you just stop me if, there, if you want to dispute a point. How's that? Pardon me? I mean, actually, cancer and genetics is fast growing, although Okay, so this, this was in genomic testing, is my understanding. Right. So, so when you say and genetics in genomic testing? No, the, sorry. The so, highest growth rate is uh, in cancer and genetics, although infectious disease is the largest volume right, it, currently. So, okay. And projected in. Okay. So, no, I, I know it's the last bullet, but, but I thought this was within genetic testing or genomic testing. The two things that were increasing were infectious diseases and cancer, but would you, I guess maybe you're suggesting Mendelian diseases as well? Is, is that right, Deborah? What do you mean by genetic and genetic? Because we, we already have. So ger germline. So if you talk about all molecular testing. Mm -hmm which includes the high throughput sequencing. Mm -hmm. Infectious disease is the largest volume of molecular, including next-gen sequencing, but the highest growth. So it's growing at about 11 percent per year, whereas cancer and germline, I call that genetics, but, okay. and I call cancer somatic. I mean, if you want to parallel them, <laughs> I'm not quite sure how to do that, but mm -hmm. genetics and or germline and cancer are growing at about 18 percent per year. Okay. I, th I think if I remember my slide correctly. Yeah, and we'll, and we'll check your slides and make sure that we've got it right, but thanks for that correction. So I'm having trouble. Germline and cancer is 18 percent. So, and we'll pretty these up here, so, but thank you much. 18 percent. Okay. Great. Yes. Please. Um, CLIA certified labs are doing sequencing. We're doing a lot of sequencing, so. Okay. Um, so. <laughs> Pardon me? Aluminum being one of them. Um, so, isn't the challenge really then hospital CLIA certified labs? Is that what we're. Deborah, I think this was your point. So it, it's really the next-gen sequencing technology. Mm -hmm. We're using CE for doing a lot of sequencing, and there are selected labs that have moved into using next-gen sequencing technology. But um, I think the vast majority of academic laboratories, I mean, I, I put a, a question out on the Association for Molecular Pathology Listserv recently saying, what do you think of this instrument versus this instrument for a clinical laboratory? And I got more answers back saying, when you find out, let me know, <laughs> rather than an answer. So wow. <laughs> all, all kinds of labs are, are trying to figure out the technology to go with and how to adopt this, how to justify it. The business plan for a hospital laboratory is very, very difficult. So would you agree then with this formulation of it, how to get hospital and academic or maybe just hospital CLIA certified labs to move to next generation sequencing? Um, it, it, it's more how to get them to pay for next gen sequencing 
instrumentation so that it can be incorporated well, into right. those labs. Well, right, yeah. Um, I mean, okay. that's Two. a subtle difference, um, okay. but we want to. I mean, clearly, it's very cool, it's new, and, and it's, we think, more cost-effective, but we don't have the opportunity to test that out necessarily, so. Okay, so. And I might and add enable as opposed to get I don't necessarily think yes. we want to oh. get them all doing it, but <laughs> enable the ones who are capable of doing it. Uh, you know, the, in talking with Illumina in distri distribution of their MySeqs, which are meant to really target the hospital, smaller labs, pathology labs, one of the biggest struggles is the whole confirmatory process that's not built into a MySeq, you know, mm -hmm. and they're, they're hoping their instrument is sample to report end to end, but that confirmatory process is not yet supported in the clinical labs are like, well, how do I do that part of it? <laughs> so I think it's, it's how do we enable these labs to be able to support the process. But most labs who would be doing next gen would likely already be doing CE, uh, capillary electrophoresis, Sanger sequencing, so, or um, have real-time PCR, I mean, and have technologies to be able to do that con confirmatory process. So, so I, maybe I think most labs do. Yeah, um, this is a great discussion, and, and it's it's very helpful, I think, to have it. I do have 50 slides, and no, I only have 11, um, and, this, and this is slide number one. So, so if we can if we can live with this at least for the moment, um, it seems like that. Okay, great. Um, then uh, whole genome uh, is, a, is a potentially a concern. It may imply that it's complete or infallible, um, and, and that we just need to be aware of that. Uh, there aren't any FDA or CLIA standards yet for next-gen sequencing. No arguments with that, I don't think. Do we need a genomic medicine specialty? Um, an interesting thought and one that we might want to pursue. What's regulated under CLIA versus what is sort of the art of medicine in interpreting the sequences? Uh, an important point raised. Try to capture the marked variability in interpretation to understand it. So one of the, uh, I think, issues that was raised was that, gee, when you send out these um, uh, variant files, actually the BAM files, that people interpret the variants very, very differently. And, and if, if you can capture that, I think this was the, a bioinformatics point, you can actually learn to model it and, and kind of uh, uh, learn something from that. And then uh, we need bioinformaticians incorporated into pathology groups and other groups doing this kind of work. Any corrections? Great. Okay. Um, I, I made a slide for you in, in terms of the Faruqi criteria, which I thought was a nice, uh, a nice way of going about it, but you, you may want to look carefully at this one. Um, and, and actually, I think what we, what we heard, we were looking for um, uh, those who do this kind of work as well as those who pay for it to tell us, you know, what kind of evidence do you need or what, how do you make your decisions? And most of them came down to, to points very much like this. So you, you need well-controlled, adequately powered studies demonstrating analytical validity and, and clinical utility. Um, and that, that was sort of a you know, a sine qua non and, and also pretty undebatable. Um, uh, it would be helpful to have uh, clear, clearly actionable results, and I think in most cases um, uh, all of the, uh, uh, the people who spoke on this felt this way. Uh, either that you could prevent drug toxicity, you could identify a treatment path, um, uh, diagno uh, diagnose rare heritable disorders and possibly carrier testing. So those would all be examples of, of um, actionable variants, although there might be other things as well. Uh, there should be some kind of a path to a reasonable uh, level of reimbursement. There should be freedom to operate in terms of IP and patents and, and other things. Um, and uh, an interesting note, which is maybe something that we want to think about, is, is that adoption is slower if a test replaces some procedure that physicians can bill for, which was a, you know, sobering comment. You want to take that out? Oh, really? I think it's, a, it's an excellent, you know, it's on tape. <laughs> but, okay, so we will do that. No? That's fine? Okay. Great. All right. Uh, and then um, the sequencing working group was, it, was its usual energetic self. Yes. Oh, yes, sorry. That, that last slide, the clinical utility part, I mean, there's, uh, there's a nuance missing here. Uh, you know, we can't show clinical utility for three billion bases. Right. So uh, I'm, I'm not sure what the solution here is, but there, there's some element of, yeah, we want all this has to be done, the, the proving, you know, the, the evidence that's required. But then again, there's also this element of this is the whole genome, and so how do we handle that? Mm -hmm. Good, good point. And I think maybe we want to qualify this first point, you know, sort of like where possible or where feasible or that, because I, I think your point, and you should make it yourself, was was that when you have this, it's great, but a lot of times you don't. Isn't isn't that right? Yeah, 
I, I think the problem is getting, you know, the payers aren't here maybe today, but um, it, that's what they're looking for in terms of reimbursement. And mm -hmm. so if you don't have that, I, I don't know what the solution is for reimbursement. Okay. Great. So we'll just call it what payers looking for. <laughs> okay. If I could type, it would help. Um, okay. And again, you know, these, these are, it's not like these are instantly going to end up in a, you know, a, a paper somewhere. It's just uh, we're trying to capture a, a lot of the discussion today. So. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> they'll, they'll just end up on the internet. I'll be looking for a job. <laughs> yeah, that's right. We could, well, maybe I should be fair then, and and we'll just take that out. So I wanted to make sure that you were you were paying attention. So <laughs> great, it worked. Yes. <laughs> All right, good. Because we do want you to come back and and still still be employed. Okay. So um, so that was the all right sequencing working group. Um, uh, there was talk, or, or hopefully plans, um, of uh, perhaps producing a white paper laying out research and policy agenda for implementing um, sequencing in, in clinical care, um, and recognizing that this has already been done, but, but can one um, do it in a more perhaps systematic or, or provide kind of a roadmap for doing that. Um, focus uh, with a, a lot of work and a lot of potential tasks to be done, it may be appropriate to focus on the areas that, that aren't being done currently or that are gaps um, so that there's uh, not overlap or duplication. And then the, the highest priorities, we, we may hear from the sequencing group after they've had their, their working group meeting. Um, one high one it sounded like was how to assign clinical relevance to variants, especially with this problem that Brad pointed out, as, as did Heidi, that you only see a couple of them, and, and how in the world do you, do you get enough to, uh, to know what it means. Um, Howard seemed to feel that the wet lab was moving so fast that this was not a gap area and not an area that you needed to do much in. Um, and and one, uh, one point that was made, I, I think, by, by the lab group was uh, uh, considering genomic critical values. So what are the, the um, uh, critical, maybe that was Deborah's point, uh, what are the, the things that you absolutely have to report, just like you have to report a potassium of 2.0 or whatever. Uh, determining what the legal requirements are for data return, which varies by state, uh, which is an interesting thing and might be might be something worth trying to to um, uh, com uh, compile in some place uh, at some point. Um, and there's there was no substitute for knowing what the the patient and the clinician really want to know uh, in terms of making decisions on on what to report. Yes, if I could make a comment, and it it might be a minor semantic comment, and if so, I'll stop after saying it once. This term <coughs> return of results or data return uh, for me is a research term. In clinical laboratories, you talk about what do you report to the physician, and all of the professional societies and regulatory bodies give guidance on the structure of clinical reporting, the content of clinical reporting, what's primary and what's secondary in a clinical report. CDC has taken the lead in developing some recommendations around molecular genetic clinical reporting guidelines, right? Return of results, for me at least, implies a research study deciding whether or not to return information and which information to return. So in all areas of <coughs> developing any guidelines or what legal requirements are, I think they're two separate issues, and we should try to keep them clear. Does, does everyone agree with that? Yes. Yes? yes. Yep. <laughs> okay. okay. Great. I don't think, hopefully I don't think I use those terms at all here. So, so I should be good. But your, but your point's well taken, David. And, and I think what, what we, we then want to sort of focus on is, is when we're talking about the pathology labs, which we often don't talk about unless we have pathologists in the room, and when we're talking about what the research study does. Uh, although presumably there is some return of results from the clinician to the patient that was based on reporting. So, so they may, you know, intersect there. But well, there are no, no, uh, that that would still be part of medicine, and we would not use right? we would not use that term. Really, which okay. is yeah. again for me, that's a that's a concern. It's an ELSI concern. It's a topic of debate and grants and research. It's a research issue. In so clinical medicine, whatever goes in the clinical report, the physician chooses how to deliver that information to a patient. And that's still reporting? It, it's reporting, it's reporting. yeah. It, as long as you all agree with that. that. Yeah, well, it's reporting and it's commu 
It's also communication of results to the patient and how that's okay. done. Is it only done by the physician treating the patient? Is the pathologist or geneticist involved? Does a genetic counselor have to be involved? Um, and does it go into the personal health record? Because mm -hmm. we all now have personal health records, and so mm -hmm. where do you put it there? Okay. Uh, Mike, you had a comment? Just more terminology. Uh, we've been calling that dis the disclosure visit, the, the physician to the patient. Ah, uh, okay. So, so maybe there's not, you know, for, no, I mean, it's a, it's a good point because it, I think Dave is right is that uh, people do use return term for, for that piece and, and maybe, maybe we can get them not to. Um, we, we can certainly try, but uh, disclosure is an interesting one. Okay, and Dan, yes. Yeah, I think um, our group talked about this a little bit, and I think it really, the same value, it depends on where it comes from and the clinical contextualization. You know, is it, you know, you got a test in the clinical setting and you found maybe a little add-on versus this is getting something out of a biobank and you find the same yeah. thing. So, so, so this I think this disclosure visit concept is great. This sounds to me a lot like a clinical research interface issue, and, and maybe one that that group could address and give us something that perhaps would be a little more coherent than we can come up with with me standing at this podium. Is that, is that something we could ask? Sure, I have Mark 40 to? minutes to get there. Uh, yeah, that's <laughs> right. <laughs> Great. Or at some subsequent meeting, which we, we hope to have. No, I, I mean, it sounds like it's a real issue. So, great. Thank you. Okay, um, the financial and reimbursement discussion was certainly lively, which, which we very much appreciate. It doesn't look like any of them were able to make it back today, which is very unfortunate. But um, the, the point was made that uh, utilization of imaging was driven by regulatory approval and reimbursement rather than e evidence of benefit. And that example has been brought up uh, numerous times in saying why is, is genomics being held to a, a different standard. I guess some might say the problem was not that genomics is being held to a different standard. The problem is that that was a mistake. Um, but, but Regardless, it is an, an interesting point. Um, evidence evaluate or evaluation of evidence needs to work from a clinical problem rather than starting with a test. That was an excellent point. Um, and then there, several of them gave kind of their pr uh, principles for coverage, which is you know pretty much similar to, to what we heard from the from the labs that the services are related to prevention, diagnosis, or treatment. The information will affect the course of treatment. The care and or treatment is likely to improve the outcome. And and this improvement, an interesting one, is attainable outside of investigational settings. So this is, is a real world setting, not just uh, not just in, in research. And then the, cons the services are consistent with the design of the plan. Uh, and I think there are, there are aspects of plan design that, that we weren't able to get into and that I certainly don't understand, but it's a, a reasonable point. Comments? Okay. Great. And also there were um, uh, suggestions in terms of what the evidence standards should be. Obviously, analytic validity, clinical validity, clinical utility. Uh, final approval from appropriate regulatory bodies, bodies is very helpful, although it's not, um, it, it's not, again, a sine qua non. But when it's required, then obviously uh, the, the payers would, would expect it as well. It wasn't clear to me how you know when it's required and when it's not. Maybe you all know that and, and we could expand on that. Um, and there should be demonstrated be uh, benefit. Uh, also, the point made that um, uh, having genetic counselors available by phone was, was actually quite an advance um, and, and made it much easier for physicians to use these tests. Any comments here? No? Yes. I think that that um, final approval bullet has to do with the, uh, when the FDA needs to require something, like if it's a kit or whenever FDA oh. will, that, that, that's what that's referring to. Oh, great. Thank you. Okay. Super. Uh, in addition, uh, we, we heard that unit costs were the biggest driver of the escalation in healthcare costs and not utilization. So, uh, so bringing down the costs of individual tests is, is probably, and again, tests were only, you know, a small proportion, I think 0.5 percent we heard uh, of overall healthcare costs, but this is an, an important uh, point. Costs for molecular diagnostics have ridden, risen much faster than other costs, 14 percent per year, just in, in a two to three year period. Um, the point made that payers shouldn't fear innovation, even though it always seems to cost more, um, but look for those that will replace more expensive and less effective technologies. Uh, certainly, if, if some of the, the DNA um, uh, testing for, for chromosome abnormalities uh, um, it, it becomes widely accepted, that would replace uh, amniocentesis, which would be a major advance and certainly would replace uh, more expensive and, and at least riskier technologies. Um, 
And there was an, an idea uh, suggested and seemed to be uh, res resonating with the group as a whole that we find a way to make public-private uh, academic collaborations to uh, design studies to produce the decisive information that will convince payers as well as others to, you know, hospital labs to buy the equipment and as well as uh, payers to pay for it um, to, to do these kinds of studies. And I think we'll, we'll hear a little bit more about potential plans, uh, plans to move that forward. Any changes to this one? Okay, um, in public health, Toby talked about potential partnerships in, in genetics and chronic disease uh, leadership in the state health departments, I think a group that we have not included in these meetings and, and one that we may want to consider uh, doing. Local cancer and heart disease coalitions, national professional and disease related organizations. Uh, I think we recognized yesterday that the, the professional organizations are again a group that has not generally been at this table and perhaps is a, a stakeholder group we need to address. Uh, patients obviously, genetic alliance or patients like me. Um, considering cross-cutting goals and impact on health disparities would be would be wonderful to the degree that it can be done. Uh, and there was an, an interesting example um, as, as, as a potential um, um, sort of a use case scenario of um, uh, hemochromatosis homozygotes who have uh, signs and symptoms suggesting they might actually have the disease and yet are still getting iron per their medical records. Changes to this? No. Okay. Uh, then we had the working group reports, and and we will have their reports, and they'll be they'll be posted. But uh, but just to, to kind of summarize where where we are, one suggestion uh, was perhaps using a, a small business mechanism um, with Epic or one of the other medical record um, um, systems to to incorporate some of the family history tools, um, considering social network software and infrastructure for collecting or correcting uh, family history information from relatives. So as a relative reports it, can they port it over to their relative and say, you should know what's happening to me, and I'd like to know what's happening to you, that kind of thing. Um, a variety of interventions could be tested, optimizing um, uh, collection and use or action on, on um, family history information in emergency settings, such as those regarding a potential myocardial infarction, uh, bringing to other environments, such as rural and underserved areas, uh, educational environments, such as residents and training, um, and, and of course the, the uh, ever-present question, does the intervention work in usual care? Um, and then uh, the hope that, that the family history group would link to the sequencing working group, um, uh, both on Mendelian and complex traits, and sort of, of course, in the rare variant space. Jeff, did I get that right? Great. Okay, the periodontal group. Um, thanks, Murray, for, for keeping, to, keeping us to task here on, on this one. Um, uh, the management of patients with diabetes and periodontitis sounds like it's an, an active area, certainly at Marshfield and, and with some other partners that you're, you're developing. Um, management of dental patients is, a, is an area where genomics can contribute, especially in pain management and coagulation. <laughs> Um, there's an interest in bringing pharmacogenomic to, uh, data to dentists with uh, uh, um, computerized decision support tools um, and, and ways of developing those. There may be an, an oral systemic personalized medicine model that could be developed uh, that would, again, uh, build on this uh, link with diabetes, periodontitis, and maybe other diseases in periodontitis. And the hope or the expectation that sequencing might replace culture in the, in the microbiology laboratory, uh, which has potential for a huge impact, and, and I think we could note that in, in in clinical care, it, it already has replaced uh, culture in, in many cases. Um, so, so this may be something to do in dentistry as well. Is that, does that seem like a reasonable summary? Great. Okay. And I'm done. Um, so many thanks to the planning committee and to, oh, yes, Deborah. Can I just say that I think for the laboratories there also was something not captured and I thought it might come through in other areas and didn't think about it, which is the uncertainty of regulatory oversight of all this testing in the clinical setting. Mm -hmm. Um, we don't know what FDA is thinking about this. We don't know. Uh, while you said there aren't clear and FDA guidelines, standards in this area, um, you know, FDA has been talking about IVD MIA, which they've now <coughs> done away with that terminology, so we don't even know what to refer to it as. And um, but the CAP has created some standards, but standards are kind of different than the regulatory oversight and whether we will be allowed to do this under an LDT f um, process. Uh, you explain that? Um, LDT? Uh, laboratory developed test. Oh, thank you. So we can um, validate uh, tests in the clinic, in a CLIA certified laboratory under CLIA standards and um, bring it to clinical use without going through the FDA. Uh -huh. um, and then, but the FDA, 
has just waived its oversight at the moment, but it may step in at some point and regulate it, which we don't know what that would do to using next-gen sequencing technology in clinical laboratories. So this is a huge clinical dark cloud. And, and our FDI colleague is going to make a comment in a second. Just one second. Have, have I captured? What, what you said by the, in that third bullet there? No, it's, it's actually uncertainty of regulatory oversight. Regu oh, sorry. Okay. Yes, that, okay. that's what I just yep. thought. Zarina, standards yeah. is a different thing right. than oversight. Okay. It's, it's oversight. Okay. So just regulatory oversight rather than standards development. Yes. Okay. Um, Perfect. And FDA doesn't do standards, so CLIA sorry. does standards. Okay. And the FDA can correct me. So in the previous bullet, it would be no CLIA standards, you know, although CAP, ACMG, and AMP now do have standards that they're introducing for next-gen sequencing technology, including the bioinformatics. And, and I'm going to send those checklist questions to the um, sequencing working group. Oh, great. Thank you. Okay. So you think that this captures it now? Yeah. This yes. I just had a quick question about um, freedom to operate. We didn't discuss that a lot, but um, you know, sitting here thinking about returning data to patients, um, I know there was a recent Supreme Court case, Prometheus, um, that many people seem to believe is going to invalidate a lot of the diagnostic patents that are out there. I mean, when we start to think about clearing the way for every base that we might want to report, I mean, is anybody working on that or thinking about that? Uh, may, may, I, may I comment? So I was just at a Cold Spring two and a half day, Cold Spring Harbor um, two and a half day conference with a whole room full of um, patent attorneys, <laughs> and they were. Wow. Yeah, it does. <laughs> it was pretty uh, weird. Um, they were talking language that I didn't understand at all, but they didn't understand what I was talking about. But I was definitely communicating the clinical impact of what they were doing. And um, they, they heard me and a few others. Wayne Grody was there, uh, f uh, Bob Desnick, a few others. There were only, I think, four physicians in the room. So, um, but the, the patent issue is huge. And um, while the statement was made, and, and it was even discussed by the patent attorneys, that next-gen sequencing may not impinge, you know, um, uh, infringe um, the, some of the patents, when you have a quarter of the genome patented, uh, it's daunting. You can't possibly, from a medical perspective, when you're doing an exome or a genome, Avoid think it. about how to collect all those, you know, licenses and pay the royalties and, and everything. Mm -hmm. So, so do you think if we add patent issue is huge? Is that? that that's <laughs> fine. And there actually is someone um, is. starting a clearinghouse um, really? for patents. Um, really? Uh, yeah. And I can give you uh, her oh, contact right. information if you're interested. Oh, absolutely. She was one of the patent attorneys. Well, again, this Myriad case, uh, Prometheus versus Myriad, you know, some people believe that that kind of opens the door towards you know, invalidating all of those claims. and. Uh, yeah. Oh, whatever. There, there were two, yeah. Well, I'm not a patent attorney, but I, well, but no, I'm very confused by it. Yeah, yeah. So the Myriad case is the one that's challenging the ability to patent human genes and human DNA sequence that's moving forward, and the prediction is based on Prometheus that that case could lead to a decision about whether human DNA sequence and human genes are patentable or not. And I'm not sure that there's too much more we could all do uh, while that case is proceeding. Depending on the outcome of that case, problem could be solved, or we could decide it's a major impediment to diagnostics using large-scale sequencing and we need to do something else. Um, so, I'm, so it has to be on the list of concerns, concerns. I guess. And okay. I mean, likewise, coming back to the CLIA FDA regulatory, it sort of is an obligatory bullet item on your list of worries. Um, on the other hand, my view is FDA posture is the same as NHGRI, is learning from the community, coming to these meetings, trying to understand what we're doing, and encouraging the community to work together to create databases, to create standards that will make it easier them to decide if and how they need to regulate this new technology. So I think um, we should be 
encouraging more FDA participation at these meetings because my experience over the last five years with chromosome microarray and now with sequencing is they come to learn and every time they hear about a community effort to develop standards, they're here to encourage us that's the right thing to do. And their worry is more about individual laboratories being too far ahead of the curve when there are no standards. Great. Uh, yes, last comment. Yes, yeah, so thank you, David, for that. Uh, I just wanted to add, because we put the bullet, that there is regulatory uncertainty, and that's certainly true. But there is, uh, you know, there are many misstatements, and that's the other part that we are trying to uh, correct or, or let people know when we are at these meetings that people assume about FDA. And one of them was th somebody yesterday said there is no a FDA guidances for IVDs. There is number of, that's what we do. We have a number of guidances for IVDs, for instance. So it's the same with standards. Yeah, we don't do standards per se, but we participate in a bunch of standards. Uh, there are CLSI guidance, uh, standards that you may want to add to the list of uh, what you have with ACMG. CAP are in development. So there are a lot of uh, ways to figure out how to evaluate. Sorry, but CLSI? Yes, CLSI. And Clinical helping, what, what is that? Clinical, Clinical Laboratory? Lab Standards Institute. And they're working actually Thank on the you. guideline right now. Okay. For next gen sequencing. Great. Dan's going to tell me that we're really, really over time. But uh, Brad, maybe one last, last comment. Yeah, I was just going to say on the patent issue and, and that territory, uh, we actually have a, gr a grant funded uh, research in this area to, to Bob Cook Deegan. And it'd be really interesting to maybe hear what he has to say if he could come to one of these meetings or something. It was Sorry, use microphone. He would what? He, he was at the Gene Patton oh, was Cold Spring oh, Harbor meeting great. also. Okay, yeah, so we'll try and do that. Okay, so we do need to finish, I think. Yes. Um, if Deborah, if you could send that uh, clearinghouse information to, to me, and we'll, we'll post it on the website for this, which will be up on the Office of Population Genomics and HTRI uh, website, so. Dan? Okay, no, I, I think, <coughs> unless there are burning questions, I think we'll, uh, we'll go on to our, uh, uh, a couple of presentations this morning.